Hello and welcome to the Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Johnson. The Local Leaders Podcast provides a platform for successful business owners to share their stories, their experiences, their advice, and their ideas in order to help our listeners achieve more success in their business and in their lives. Get ready. Another great show is coming up. Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Jeff Johnson. I'm your host of the Local Leaders Podcast. I want to welcome you to another uh, wonderful edition, and, and we're just thrilled to today uh, to be able to talk to Sean Gaffner. Sean has got three restaurants up and running in um, Longmont, Colorado. Um, the primary one that we we initially started talking with Sean about was The Roost. He's also got uh, Jefe's Taco and Tequila and Smoking Bowls. And uh, he's going to give us a little hint about a number four that's coming, uh, coming in the pipeline. So welcome to the show today, Sean. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for contacting me. This is great. Hey, yeah, we, we, um, you know, we're always looking for, for great entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs who have, uh, have been able to kind of take a, a concept and make it successful and then expand. And, you know, some, and we'll talk about this in, in just a minute, but, uh, or a few minutes, but it's interesting how, you know, some people will expand the one brand and make multi locations out of it and other people just have so many ideas going through their head they start all these all these other you know individual brands so you're the latter <laughs> in that in that conversation but uh hey i want to stop talking and give you a few minutes to to maybe share the story of um uh you know usually we, we talk about just just the one restaurant the roost but i'd love to just kind of hear your evolution um, uh, you know, of, of kind of how you came up and, and how you got started in your first one and, and expanded into the other, other locations, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, I mean, to, to really tell it, I'll do a quick version of the whole story. You know, I grew up on a, a farm and cattle ranch in the middle of California. And so um, the, the, basically the day I turned 18, I moved to a city cause I just wanted to get off the farm and yeah. moved down to Southern California and ended up, uh, working at Applebee's was my first job off of the farm and just expediting at Applebee's and loved it. Just couldn't believe they were paying me to work inside air conditioning with cute girls and making <laughs> tips and, uh, <laughs> beverages always, you know, 10 feet away, not on the other side of a 40 acre field. Yeah. So I just, uh, and then I started serving tables. Um, at places like that, you know, TGI Fridays and Chili's and just loved the high energy, fast paced restaurant industry and, and wanted to do it my whole life, but didn't want to, you know, be a 45 year old server, just kind of doing this, the same thing, you know, the rest of my life. Not, I mean, there's people that love that and that's great, but I wanted to, you know, see how far I could take it. And a friend of my mom's recommended culinary school, which I had never heard of. So, uh, when I was, I think 19 or yeah, 19, I uh, signed up to go tour Golden State Culinary Institute up in, I was up around Sacramento area at this time and uh, walked through, thought it was incredible. I'd never seen so much stainless steel in my life and signed up for a 21% interest Sally Mae loan and just uh, went through culinary school. And it's been for me a really incredible journey. You know, people ask all the time, should I go to culinary school? And I always say, get a job in a restaurant first. It's certainly not for everybody. And even everybody that goes to culinary school doesn't end up having a great go of it. But for me, it was good. It just, it filled in a lot of holes and um, really helped me kind of move through the ranks at a lot of restaurants, uh, often too fast. Um, I would, I'd get in somewhere and my first ever executive chef job, I was 23 and I started 24, I think. And I started as, uh, you know, garde manger and doing, you know, salads and desserts. And then there was a opportunity to start working the grill a little. So I did that. And then I think after a month I was saute and then another month later I was the sous chef. And I think I'd been working there five months. And it was uh, my first year of marriage and it was Valentine's. I went in at 5 a.m. to drop stocks and get ready for service and was supposed to be off by 5 p.m. And had, um, which was silly, young chefs thinking they're gonna be off at five o'clock on yeah. Valentine's Day, downtown Sacramento. But uh, that, and we had Valentine's plans, you know, first year of marriage. And then uh, my executive chef never showed up. So I ended up being there till about 3, 3.30 in the morning oh, gosh. Um, that day. So uh, I remember get, getting home at four in the morning and my wife just sleeping on the couch with, a, I think there was a straw and a bottle of red wine. 
um, <laughs> at the time. So, but that, so then after kind of just filling that role for a couple of months, the owner who was the executive chef, the first 30 years of this restaurant, um, promoted me to executive chef and made it a whole thing with the staff and a, a, brought in a coat with my name on it. And I was also working at two other restaurants at the same time. Oh my God. And, uh, and after like a month, I was like, this is, I don't want to be an executive chef yet. This, you know, I'm, 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 I wrote, had written in culinary school. I want to learn in and make mistakes in other people's restaurants with their money for at least 10 years before I, you know, and, and I was just too new into it. Only a couple years out of culinary school. So, uh, but I think just the resume of having culinary school on, on the resume um, and just being, you know, working, growing up on a farm and ranch and not being afraid of hard work and long hours. Um, yeah. I just, I moved up really fast. So it's been, it's been great for me. Um, so that's a little bit of like kind of where all of this came from. And, and then uh, if gosh, seven years ago now, I, I visited a friend that was living out in Colorado and started talking about just this area and, and really helping him develop a business plan. He was wanting to open like a music venue. And we ran into the building that the roost is at now. Uh, actually, after I had left, he saw it. He called me up. He said, man, there's this incredible building and it's too big for what I want to do, but you need to look at this for a restaurant. And so I flew back out in October of 2014 and met with the owner and walked through it. And it was, it's right in the heart of this really cool downtown um, in, in Longmont on right on the, in the middle of main street, um, a big two-story building with a rooftop patio. Um, and, you know, in the summer now we're up to, we have 400 seats, including our outdoor dining and just an awesome old 120 year old brick building. And, and I could just see that like, man, we could, we could really be successful out here. So went home and talked to my wife and we had four kids and I had a really great job. Um, I was the uh, executive chef partner of an uh, incredible fine dining restaurant in Northern California. And I was also working as a culinary director overseeing a couple other concepts and we were making good money and it was a really solid job. And uh, my wife agreed that we should leave that and cash out every penny we have to move to Colorado and open the roost. So we, nice. in December, just a couple months later, moved out to the roost or moved out to, to Longmont, got keys to the roost and uh, just jumped in. And I think three months later, we opened our first restaurant and, and it's wow. been incredible. It's gone great. Longmont's been amazing. Um, man, I'm, I'm so thankful to be doing business in this city. Well, just great people that are really supportive and, and appreciate good food and, and good whiskey. So that's been really yeah. helpful. Yeah, no, no doubt. Wow. What a story. And, and you didn't waste any time when you got there, did you? Um, got the we keys. We couldn't afford and, to. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you'd, you'd put it all on the line at that point. And, uh, and, and your wife was all in and I'm sure that made a, a huge difference. Does, uh, is, are, are you and she part full partners here in the, in the business? Yeah, I mean, she, sure. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's morphed over the years, you know, and so now she's in the restaurants more, but like I said, we have four kids. Our oldest is a senior in high school okay. and our youngest is in fourth grade. And so, um, but she also, you know, she's got that hard work ethic and, um, you know, which it took us through our twenties. Uh, we got married young. We were like, I think 22 and 21. And, um, and, uh, we even talked about it. Like after we were about, married about a year, you know, do we want to wait to have kids or should we just start having kids while we're broke and get them out of the house? And then maybe <laughs> we'll have a little more money, um, you know, in 20 years when they start leaving and we can enjoy our free time so we kind of yeah. went with that one and started to have so through our 20s she was at home taking care of kids and um and which meant i was always working you know at least three jobs um, yeah i don't think i ever had less than three jobs for 15 years um because that's just what it is in restaurants trying to make it work and um and so just that work ethic of her you know i'm going to take care of the kids you go work and so supportive that like there would be times you know i'd have my one day off a week and she'd be like, you sure you shouldn't be at the restaurant? So <laughs> that, I don't know how much of that was, you know, she she wanted me to, you know, be out of the house or how much it was her just trying to overly, and that's not true. And she's just trying to overly support, you know, us and yeah. what we were working towards. And so um, it was really amazing because being able to commit the amount of times it takes, you know, it takes a, a lot of time to, you know, be a chef and become a chef and and learn all you have to learn and and, you know, go up through the ranks and and so there's to not have the pressure of like man i'm really 
letting my wife down by not being home and helping with the kids. You know, we had a, a just we're both committed to like, let's go for it. Let's yeah. hammer down. And um, so, yeah, she's been amazing. And now now she went she put herself through the um, Institute of Design or something through uh, New York Art Institute, I think it was. And so she had, like is like the designer for the restaurants. And um, and she also yeah, she's do does all kinds of things. She does uh, I think this hat and wearing a Hefe's hat, all of our merchandise. We do tons of hats and shirts and all that stuff. She, you know, she does all that. And so she's really involved now. But yeah. it, it's growing every year and she's enjoying that and as the kids are older and, and now our our kids are working the restaurants too, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to have uh, nice to have some indentured labor that you, <laughs> you can pull in and, and get some help out of. Well, that's, that's awesome. And, and it just goes to show the importance of, of your partner, whether it be your wife or your business partner or whomever, all of you kind of being on the same page and the same wavelength and have the same goals in mind and can support each other. Um, I want to ask you about when, you know, when you, when you started the roost, this was your first, your thing, uh, or you guys thing. And, um, so any, significant challenges there that that kind of slapped you in the face that you hadn't expected uh when you got in i don't know if there are at that time any that i wasn't expecting having been in the restaurant industry for 18 years i think at that point um um but there were definitely significant challenges uh you know i mean just like i said you know we had to open we i think between uh cashing out a couple um, like 401ks and what we had in the savings account and everything. I think we had $42,000 that we scraped together to move out here that we had to cover moving costs, living without a salary for four months, uh, what, three and a half months. Um, and, uh, and then just, you know, scraping together money to open the restaurant. And so uh, we, we came to opening day. I think we had six cents, cents in our uh, personal banking account the day we opened the roost. So we knew it, it had to make it, it had to work. Um, and then just so then just, you know, getting funding for nobody wants to give a restaurant money. Right. Um, and so uh, even just getting creative with that, we, we ended up opening the roost, doing all the construction. We knocked down walls. We changed like where the entrance was. We took out a bar. We did, we did a lot. And um, all in was we spent $220,000, which is insane for what we did. But we were in there swinging sledgehammers, you know, all day, every day. Um, just did everything we could with ourselves and our friends and um, <laughs> paying a general contractor under the table just to sign off on something we did. And, um, mm-hmm. and so we we had to get really creative you know we um we had some family that lent us a little bit of money and we found this uh it's called colorado enterprise fund which is a really awesome company that helps startups colorado is a great state um as far as supporting startup businesses a lot of the great ones have come out of this um you know a a lot of concepts people are familiar with came from colorado and i see why now um there are a lot of state funded grants and um, and loans that, you know, you can't get a traditional loan, but like Colorado Enterprise Fund, I think they gave us $30,000. Um, and then another really helpful tool that I've talked to some other people as they've been opening their first restaurants um, is like a lease to own type of company. We use a company called North Star Leasing and where I sent them, you know, I, I filled out my, what I needed for equipment and uh, FF&E, you know, fixtures, furniture and equipment. Mm-hmm. And it, I think it came to about $35,000 then. And so they basically, they purchase it for you. They own it. You make payments over two years and then your last payment, you buy it off them. And so for them, it's, they've got the collateral. Um, so it's fairly secured for their investors. Um, and so that's really helpful. I think for restaurants, especially uh, the first you know, few years of you, you've got to show quite a few years of success before you can start getting more traditional loans and even right. lines of credit. So, yeah, so we getting really creative with funding, um, but we were able to do it and, and, you know, we couldn't do everything we wanted to do or felt like we needed to do, but, um, you know, you, you just decide, okay, what can we do to get open? And then each year we pour more and more money back in. I mean, we've done big remodels, um, you know, each year we've done some things to get it to where we're like, now we really love the building, how it is, but we got open and we were successful and we blew projections out of the water and made some money and it's, it's been a great road. So not easy, but so funding, definitely a big one. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, that is usually the, you know, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurs, um, 
hardest part of getting started is is trying to scrape together those funds and and find a way to to make it happen. And I was going to say, but you kind of covered it eloquently, that um, creativity is the key uh, when it comes, you know, to you know even things, you know, the leases on buildings. And you know, there's a lot of landlords out there today with with lots of spaces and. Uh, you can get super creative with uh, your in your negotiations to try to find a way to get yourself in, um, because you know, of course, you got equipment. And I'm glad you mentioned North Star Leasing. I'm not familiar with them, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that out as well because I'm sure some other folks would would like to to know more about that opportunity. Um, and I know there's others out there, but um, you know, you just gotta you gotta be creative. You gotta really want it, and um, you gotta go out there and put it all on the line to make it happen. Uh, which you guys did. So, so tell me now you ran, so, so you guys ran the roost for how many years before you opened, um, taco and tequila bar. We opened the roost, uh, March 21st, 2015. And we opened Hefe's three blocks down the road, um, April 8th, 2016. So a couple weeks after our one year anniversary, I, our, we had hired our Hefe's team and started training them and they catered our roost one year anniversary party. Oh my God. <laughs> that was the first <laughs> night actually that like everybody kind of came together and we had some friends who had just opened a brewery in town that same year. And so they let us just use their space for free. And he so Hefe's brand new team before they opened catered the, the party at that brewery for the roost. And, and it was awesome. It was a ton of fun. Um, yeah. right about a week before all the real work started. Yeah. You didn't, you really didn't waste any time with, um, you know, uh, basically 13 months between opening the first one to getting to the second one. And, and uh, let me backtrack a little bit. Tell me, tell me for the, our audience who or the audience there in the area who maybe haven't been to the roost yet, what the, what that concept's all about and, and uh, just a little about the restaurant itself. Yeah, totally. It's, it's a casual American restaurant. Um, but we source as much as we can locally. Um, one of my best friends, Clint Buckner, um, raises all of our beef, pork and lamb for the restaurants and his, um, his ranch is just a couple miles from my house on the west side of Longmont over here. So we actually met about a year after I opened the roost um, through motorcycles, oh, <laughs> we yeah. both ride dirt bikes, and then um, started talking about um, me and he, he raises all like all organic fed. I mean, it's true free range grass, not just grass fed, but grass finished. Like it's really high quality product. It's actually um, some of his uh, beef, pork and lamb is in some uh, Michelin starred restaurants in Colorado. And so we started talking about like, well, you know, I can't pay what they're paying. And so we just started talking about, well, if I buy a whole animal, so I just, I, I buy the whole cow, I use a hundred percent of it and we divide it up between the restaurants. And so, um, you know, because that's for them, the biggest thing for smaller ranchers is, you know, utilizing all the product. Everybody wants your filet in New York and ribeye. And so, right. you know, if I could use everything all the way to the tongue and the cheek, and we've used everything, um, then we could get it down to an affordable price and, and be able to serve like that high quality, uh, you know, beef, pork and lamb that again, they're serving at some Michelin star restaurants here, and we're doing it in a $15 burger. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's casual American, uh, cuisine. We've got a uh, uh, couple bars, an awesome rooftop. And so it's just been a, it's been a great, it's been a, it's been casual food, but I really came up in um, all fine dining or even really, you know, upscale. The most casual place I worked was PF Chang's 20 years ago, right out of culinary school, which was pretty upscale in the area where I was. And it was a great experience learning to walk cook. I love that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it's it's casual American, but we don't take any shortcuts because I don't know how to. I don't know how to use those things. Yeah. So we, you know, we've got a short rib sandwich that you know, whatever, fourteen dollars for a short rib sandwich. It takes us three days to make because of starting with the stock and then braising the beef and then making the demi. And uh, so it's it's we call it craft casual American. Like that, I like that craft casual. I'm gonna make a note of that one. I may borrow that from you sometime. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't coin it. <laughs> That's awesome. And and um, Hefe's Taco and Tequila is pretty self-explanatory. And um, uh, I'm sure you got some good top shelf liquor in there that uh, that your uh, patrons are enjoying. And um, gosh, I, I love those types of places. Now tell me about Smoking Bowls. Um, when did so it come along in the journey? Sure. So in the same way that, you know, the um, the first year of the roost, we saw that we had two taco um, dishes on our menu and those were two of our top sellers. And so uh, it made it, that helped 
um, you know, a little market research for opening the next place and being like, hey, Longmont wants some tacos. Um, in the same way, both the Roost and Hefe's um, for years, in every, every bowl we did, we have a, a like a ahi poke bowl at the Roost and a burrito bowl at Hefe's and, and bowl food was just really growing. And, um, and so we found this uh, building that we just loved. And it used to be a bakery, so it's this incredible kitchen. It's like 70% kitchen and 30% um, dining in the front. And so we, we knew we really wanted to be in that building, and um, we could use the space for uh, prep for the other restaurants. And um, we ended up actually creating, building a pretty awesome pastry kitchen back there and hiring this really great pastry chef, and she makes all everything like all the ice cream for all the restaurants and all the desserts and everything so so we really wanted that kitchen so we created this little fast casual concept called smoking bowls which is all things bowls rice bowls and noodle bowls and salads and even a bowl of cheese fries just because they're delicious and um and so we created the concept to get that space and we love this concept um it's it opened in august of 2019 and then early 2020, we had to close it for the first time. And then it was closed for four months. And then we opened it. I think we were open another four or five months before we had to close again and for another four months. And so it had a, it's been rough. And so now in the, the third time of closing it, um, at, you know, because of the pandemic, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this, this third time of opening it, we opened in April 2021. And we decided just to like really kind of downshift and we just do lunch right now. It was seven days a week, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. And now it's we're just doing lunch five days a week and keeping the team small. You know, everybody in the country is dealing with staffing right now. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we we have 173 staff between all wow. the restaurants, but 100 of them are at the roost. And so, you know, even as we get applications, um, we would fill needs at Hefe's and the Roost and the bigger restaurants where that felt like a more in immediate need um, right. than smoking bowls, which is a much smaller concept. And so now it's, I mean, we have this kitchen manager, this guy who's been cooking with me for, I think, five years now. He's worked at all the restaurants and he's, he's um, running the kitchen 90% just by himself right now. My wife, you know, she runs the front three days a week and we have a couple other great people that help, but just kept that staff really small for now. Um, but it's been great. We love it. It's all of my all of my managers. We have a total of 13 managers between the restaurants, and they all say that their favorite food is smoking bowls. Oh, so really? we love it, but it's it's had a hard go of it so far. Um, but you know what? It's paying for itself, and it's paying for a really great pastry kitchen. And we were able to, by doing that, we we uh, t combined between the Roost and Hefe's, the, um, I think it was 2019, we did like $50,000 in dessert sales. And then at one, our first year of, having that pastry kitchen and the pastry chef, we did $200,000 in dessert sales. Wow. So, uh, and just more quality. And dessert, for me, and I think a lot of chefs, desserts are that pain in your ass thing that you don't really want to do, but you got to do it. And, you know, you come up with the things that you can do well. And right. um, and so it's been really nice having somebody who's actually passionate about desserts and she loves it. And so we have, you know, really great desserts because of it. Well, that's, that, that's awesome. I mean, when you open up, you know, a, a concept that... Uh, and, and then you get hit with the pandemic, of course, that's going to, you know, that's going to really be a setback and, and make it, make it a lot more challenging. And, but, but you guys didn't really open it for the restaurant's sake. You opened it kind of almost like, a, um, I want to almost say ghost kitchen kind of thing. And, um, but you know, you've got the, you got the, the pastry kitchen out of it and you're supporting all your other locations. And, um, and that's fantastic that, that it worked out like that. Um, and, and that's really thinking as well as to how to kind of get those economies of scale, um, uh, recognizing opportunities in the market with the taco, you know, the whole taco piece and the bowl piece, uh, and then bringing that all together. And, um, you know, it works. I can see how it kind of fills different buckets for you. So a very important part, even though it may not be as large uh, in terms of sales. So now you're on number four. You, you know, you were telling me earlier, you, you guys were tearing down ceiling last night. So yep. <laughs> any chance you can give us a sneak peek at what's coming sure. or is it, is it still a trade secret? No way. I don't, you know what? I'm not one of those chefs. Literally people <laughs> ask me all the time for, you know, is there any way you could, you know, 
kind of tell me that recipe? I'm like, email me. I'll email you every recipe I have. It's it's not the recipes. Our recipes are great. Our food is delicious, but that's not what makes a place successful. You know, it's it's your people. It's the experience you have. It's the way you feel when you go there. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not. I'm definitely not one of those uh, guys that that keeps any secrets. Um, what I have, I'm happy to share. So, uh, honestly, even as as early as the roost. Um, with all the concepts, it starts with the building. I feel like the building really tells me what the what it wants the concept to be. You know, obviously the concept has to make sense in the target market and all of that, but the roost is this 120 year old brick building and we added a bunch of reclaimed wood and old rust and made this like just really cool American restaurant. And then Hefe's, um, it was just a small, uh, smaller, long, narrow building and I, with an open kitchen. We opened it up a little bit more even. And I'm like, man, this would be a cool like taco shop. And um, and so like I said, with bowls, you know, that small front area, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, we can do a cool little fast casual concept here. And so this one, it actually used to be an Outback Steakhouse. It's over, I live close by it. And so I saw it close um, during the pandemic. I think a bunch of Outbacks across the country closed. And so this local one, you know, they sold the building and it was sitting there empty for a while. So I just started asking about it. And, um, you know, we had, we obviously, we just reopened in spring, uh, opened the restaurants in spring of uh, 2020. And it was a few months after that and, and things were going well, but coming into 2020 before the first time we had to close down um, because of COVID, I had been building towards a team of directors and we had, I've just got, I've got incredible people that are managing for me. And um, a lot of them have been with me. I have, I think I have, I don't know, 20 people that helped us open the roost six and a half years ago that still work for us. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, my GM had been with me for five years or she had been the GM, I think for, for five years. And so coming into 2020, we were planning on uh, opening a fourth thing. Um, and so we, I had built um, a team of directors. I have three now, a beverage director who oversees all three of the bars, uh, the beverage programs. I have a culinary director who, um, oversees all of three kitchen managers and then a director of operations who is the uh, Alicia has been our GM um, since the beginning of the roost and so and so she's just like our director of operations uh, overseeing all of the GMs so we have this like we're just primed and ready to open something well and we have leads that are ready to become managers and assistant managers that are ready to become general managers and we just we've got great people in the pipe and so um, aside from the fact that like my passion is really creating concepts it's also developing leaders i've always been really interested in leadership and and obviously it starts with just you know and still <laughs> i think forever you know it's it's developing our own leadership but um i love also just you know developing young leaders that are it, have a passion for the industry and um, mm -hmm. could learn a lot from things that that i've learned the last 20 years and so we've just got the people so i started looking around and ended up walking through the outback building and I've wanted, I actually, I want to do a second half phase right now. Like I want to do a second or a third of um, concepts that are already working great and that would be easy, but this building just, it, it, it that's not what it wanted to be. Um, over in this part of Longmont, it just needs this um, kind of incredible experience. This, this building wants to be um, and so we're gonna be a tiki restaurant and bar. And so, you know, incredible rum drinks, um, is a third of it great food a lot of seafood which you know as a fine dining chef in california so much of what i did and what i always have loved the most is seafood mm -hmm. and so um we're gonna you know 70 percent of our menu will be seafood but we'll also you got to keep it approachable you always have that fourth person at the table that's just wants a burger so we'll have right. a great burger we'll have steak you know some great chicken dishes but uh, lots of seafood so you know, with tiki, it's one third of it's the great food, one third of it's the great fun tiki cocktails, and one third of it is just the experience, the, the escapism um, that, you know, is what where tiki came from. And so um, we're going to take this big old 6,500 square foot out back and cover the entire roof with thatch, um, <laughs> or, you know, a big thatch roof and just make it a huge tiki hut. Um, I, it's the first concept that I've ever had to have a shipbuilder. I met with a shipbuilder <laughs> yesterday who's a uh, may or may not be building me a pirate ship oh so goodness it's going to be a whole lot of fun um and and just food and drinks that i really love at, at the roost we have 100 whiskeys and at tequila we have 100 i mean at jefe's we have 100 uh, tequilas and mezcals and um at, at this it's going to be called suelo's tiki restaurant and bar we're going to have uh, 100 rums and so just like i had the, i was always a whiskey guy 
I got really into tequila and learned a lot about that to open Hefe's. And now I've been really enjoying learning about 30 year old rums and uh-huh. all the rums from the different parts of the world and how different they are. And so, yeah, it'll, it'll be a good time. Uh, well, I can tell, but I, I, I can see the passion, hear the passion, uh, see it in the body language and hear it in your voice that, uh, that, that you definitely get into doing this and creating these concepts and, um, <laughs> building a pirate ship and a tiki hut and all that good stuff. It, that's going to be really, really cool. How, um, what, what's your timing? Are you looking to get it open by next year? First yeah, next spring, year? spring 22. I'm, <laughs> I'm always the guy that I put, I push people as, as hard and as fast as I can. So I've been saying two twenty two twenty two, but I don't know if my contractors are saying two twenty two twenty two. Yeah. Yeah, well, if they're as busy as the rest of the rest of the people in the country, it's uh, you know it's it's probably tough, and I think that they are. Oh yeah. Um, so uh, w- once again, you're going to be back facing um, facing you know staffing challenges that that the whole industry as you know as as a whole we've been facing uh, since since Corona. A couple of problems or a couple of challenges. Staffing has been one. Um, food prices and food shortages. So. No, how let, let me let me backtrack to food pricing um, for what you know what your costs have, have looked like. How are you dealing with the cost increases? Are you having to raise prices? Um, kind of what's what's been your solution to to try to keep things on the right track? Yeah, I mean you hit the nail on the head earlier when you talked about it. Just takes creativity. You really got to get creative. So during the Uh, there's a, this isn't a one answer, you know, you, you, I have 10 different answers that each get me a half a percent and that gets me to where I need to be, you know, um, during the first shutdown, I was at home and I said, I need to develop a dish. That's just going to be that home run chicken dish with great cost of goods, but everybody wants it. And so, um, I, I started playing with my smoker. I hadn't really ever had anything smoked on the menu at the roost, but we do the specials a lot and things. And, and so chicken legs are always something you could get, um, in, you know, fairly inexpensive. So I started playing with, uh, you know, uh, chicken legs on the smoker and I created what, um, a dish that we call Haitian chicken. And it really comes from my first ever executive chef job was Celestine's Caribbean restaurant and voodoo lounge, downtown Sacramento. And, uh, and we did um, a dish called Haitian chicken where we took a boneless chicken thigh and we actually simmered it in our black beans, almost like a sauce. And that's how we cooked it. We'd sear it and then add the, the our Caribbean black beans with the peppers and the onions and the garlic and spices. And we'd, we'd finish the simmering the chicken thigh in that. And then we served it with a really, ref- so that was kind of spicy. And then we served it with a really refreshing tomato, cucumber, and avocado salad and white rice. And um, so I, I kind of did the same thing, but with a smoked chicken leg. So it could be a large, you know, um, you know, people, I want people to see it walking through the dining room and be like, what yeah. is that? And so I ordered these big skillets that came on these big um, wooden trays. And we, we, we cover the whole thing with black beans and then put a scoop of white rice and the chicken smoked chicken leg and the tomato cucumber avocado salad and put cilantro over it. So it's vibrant in color. It smells smoky going through the restaurant and it's on a big, huge platter. And every time you set it in front of somebody, they go, holy moly, I didn't realize I ordered that much. And I sell it for $16 and good food cost, just say that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I knew like, that was one thing. We need some home runs. And as, as much as food cost is gonna go up, a, a chicken leg is always still going to be approachable because there's so many restaurants that need chicken breasts. Yeah. And so there, that was one thing. We also diversified who we ordered from because you mentioned the shortages. That's been a huge problem. And so, right. um, you know, we already, you know, we, like I said, we get our meat from this guy and we get some, we have a few different farms that we get some produce from. And, and that actually hasn't been much, that's actually been helpful where that was, um, that was a hit on food costs before the pandemic. It hasn't fluctuated as much. Um, the local, the local products haven't fluctuated as much as, you know, some of the things that we have to get from the bigger companies. And so with the bigger companies, we went from um, just using one for a majority of things like uh, our compostables and, you know, dry good things uh, to now we have three of them. And so not only keeping them on their toes and making sure they're serving us, um, it's when we have a shortage, we can get some, we have two other options to get things from. So right. we, we kind of split up who we give. I mean, we, between all the restaurants, we spend millions of dollars a year on food. And so we've, in, we've split that up, um, c- kind of diversified who we're shop purchasing from. That's been really helpful. Um, and they don't like that. Obviously, you know, the big guy that was getting all of our business for those things before 
and started, you know, trying to say, well, you know, we may not be able to deliver to you as often and this and that. I'm like, you will. I've been with you for six years. You'll be fine. But I'm also going to purchase some from here because you've shorted me the last two times I've ordered such and such product. Right. So those are those are two big things. Getting creative with the menu, finding things that are affordable and reliable and creating a delicious dish around that that you can sell a ton of. Um, yeah, those those are probably the top two ones for me. Well, I, I really like that. And I appreciate you sharing that idea um, about being creative because it got me thinking. Um, and, and this question is totally off offbeat from what we're from what I initially was was going to ask you about. But there's so many concepts out there that that have a, you know, a sticky menu. And that's kind of what I call it. And that, that is the same menu. It never changes. They make, you know, 25 items or whatever it might be. And, and it's that way for years. What, what's your thought on that? Is, is that a good thing? Um, and maybe from a cost and, and efficiency standpoint, maybe it is, but doesn't it get stale? I'm not going to say it's a, it's a bad thing. I think for some concepts, um, you know, I just talked about the Outbacks closing, not to throw them under the bus, but I didn't see them change much the last 40 years. And I really loved them in the 90s. Um, but I don't know, you know, maybe a little change would have done them some good. Yeah. Um, but for us, we change our menu um, every fall and every spring, slightly though. But all of our restaurants, we do this. Um, and that's just for for a little bit of seasonality. You know, um, I'm not going to have, I, I, I'm not going to have, heirloom tomatoes and summer squash on my winter menu but i sure want it on my summer menu because that right. stuff sells itself and so what we do is you know we look at our product mix and the few bottom performing appetizers a couple entrees a couple we call handheld so salads taco i mean burgers tacos burritos um we we take the bottom performers and we replace them with something else you know maybe we've something we've been doing as a special that's worked really well or um, or some of the things we just change a little bit, you know, sometimes it's just a small change. We have, it's just called the roost steak. It's our, our one, um, our currently our, well, anyway, it's one of our main, like just steak entrees. And in the summer, it's got summer squash. And in the winter, it might have, uh, some hard seared Brussels sprouts. And so just kind of small changes, but that also allows us to, um, when we need to say, you know what, I mean, I just, I mentioned a $15 burger and I remember coming out saying, I'm not going to have a $15 burger. I see all these places, you know, I, you can't charge more than $13 for a burger and fries, no matter how good it is. And we raised it 50 cents a year and now we're at $15 for a burger and it's a great burger. It's like I said, it's local grass fed free range beef from right here. And, and you can buy it for $22 at some other restaurants in the state. Um, but for us, we can still do it at, at 15 bucks. And so um, just raising a couple things, a half dollar, you know, one, once or twice a year is, is really helpful where needed and getting rid of the bottom performers. Cause we have a, our menu is not huge. And so we can't have anything that's taking up space and, and our kitchen is definitely not huge. Our kitchens are uh, real small. And so we can't have things sitting on the cook's line that aren't, you know, being utilized. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, so for us, it's really important. Every, basically every October, we do like a fall winter menu. And then every uh, April, sometimes it's, go out, it's usually like May, we do kind of a spring summer menu. Um, and that's been really helpful for us. Coming from, like I said, more fine dining where I worked at one place where the menu is different almost every night, a little, a smaller, you know, uh, European cafe in Sacramento. And I worked at a lot of places where we changed them uh, monthly, um, with four or five specials a night. And so for me, twice a year feels like having the same menu. Um, yeah. and, but those small changes are really helpful for us. Or if we find something like, man, we thought that was a good idea. It worked as a special. It's a huge bottleneck and, you know, on their set menu. And when I first opened the roost, one of my favorite things, you know, sometimes you, this is just to say, sometimes you got to get rid of the top sellers too. We put a sourdough burger on. And so two nice pieces of sourdough and kind of like a patty melt type of thing. And we sold the crap out of it. And so our entire flat top was constantly full of sourdough bread. And we couldn't do all the other things we needed to do on it. And so we shortly, a couple months after we opened, I had to do my first menu change. And that was, we had to get rid of two of our top sellers. We had a lobster roll and we had a sourdough burger. And six and a half years later, people still ask us for the lobster roll and the sourdough burger. But yeah. we just couldn't, it was too much of a bottleneck. And so yeah. even, you know, knowing that like we put something on and it's been hard to pull off. Well, in six months, we know we're going to change the menu again. And there's a cost. It costs us about a thousand dollars every time um, just printing menus and things. And so 
um, but it's worth it for us because making food cost adjustments and uh, you know just efficiency adjustments. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great advice. I love the idea of of the bottom performers and kind of pulling those back and 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 really you know looking at what's selling, what's not, and making changes because um, you know when you get customers who are coming back frequently you know there's there's places we go um you know once a week or once every other week uh here in our small town that that we live in and it's the menu is the same i mean it just never changes so uh, that was a probably a personal question but i appreciate that i'm, I'm gonna share that advice with uh, with those guys and and see if we can't get something new on that menu um and i just looked at the clock and i realized that that it's getting a little bit late i've taken up uh, or in uh, used up some of your time today and I, I appreciate you so much for being on here but before I let you go I want to ask you another question sure. um, about success metrics and and I'm just interested in how you measure success for each of your businesses are you, a, you know, into the number side are you into the the feel and the happiness and the the joy of the restaurant and the energy of the restaurant kind of what, what what's important to you well, certainly not either or, um, but how I talk to my my whole team and we're we're open about everything. Our books are open and we just finished our uh, um, third quarter because we do 13 periods instead of 12 months just to kind of keep things even year to year. And so we're talking this Friday at our manager meeting. We'll we'll talk numbers a lot. And so but what I always say is and I, and I, I heard a chef say this a decade ago and it just stuck in my head. But uh, profitability is a rule to the game. You know, you, you have to be profitable or you can't play the game. Um, but it is not the metrics through which we filter every decision um, for us, uh, our culture, our staff culture, um, our, our staff being happy and healthy is number one, uh, our guests. Um, feeling welcome and feeling the love and the positive energy in the restaurants is is way more important than squeezing out a couple of nickel and dimes um and i think both of those lead to um to profitability you know a happy team and a healthy team uh for so many reasons that we could get real practical about um if we broke it down um just make you more profitable so yes the energy the vibe the positivity good leadership clear communication um all of that, um, but also, you know, profitability and numbers. And, and we, you know, like I said, we, depending on sometimes every week, we'll talk about some numbers, say, Hey, this is where we are, you know, with this and this. So let's watch that or good job on this. Um, and sometimes it's like, I think because there's been so much else going on, we haven't talked about numbers in our manager meetings for uh, two months at least. Um, and we meet every single, we meet for an hour and a half with each restaurant every single Friday. Um, which Fridays are kind of hectic, but it's the yes. only day that all the managers work. And so um, we just, we do two to three 30 at Hefe's. We do three 30 to five at the roost. Um, and then like I said, smoking bowls is a smaller team. And we actually have, I've got a couple of managers that come over from there to the roost meeting because they, they came from that team and it keeps them involved. And, you know, we don't just talk numbers or we don't just talk about the areas that keep getting missed on the cleaning list, but we also talk about leadership a lot. And so um, we're currently as a team reading Danny Myers uh, setting the table together and a chapter a week and everybody talks about it a little bit. So um, that that time with with our managers every Friday, it's, it's the most important time of my week. It's my favorite time of my week. Um, I love everything I do, but nothing as much as just spending time with my team. Um, and so, you know, this Friday was specifically about the quarter three numbers, but also because they bonus. We take 10% yeah. of all of our profit, no matter how we got there, no other matri metrics involved, even if they blow labor or whatever, whatever goes to the bottom line, 10% of it, we give back to the managers. And then a separate outside of that, we bonus the directors. So they care about the numbers. Um, they love the numbers. They celebrate the numbers. And, and it's showing. We just finished quarter three at 18% profit, which for a restaurant, I'm pretty damn proud of. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, and and is that across all the units? The that's total company. So yeah. some are a little higher, some are a little lower. Yeah, um, like I said, uh, bowls. It's it's we do a quarter million dollars in lunch sales right now is what we're looking at a, a year. And so, um, like I said, it it pays for the space, it pays for the pastry kitchen, it pays for employees, and you know makes a little bit of profit. But yeah. really, you know, Roost and Hefe's Roost is a set is a, on track to be a five million dollar a year restaurant. 
they said we opened in March, so it won't do five million this year. But if we took, if we plugged in our worst January and February ever, we'd do five million in sales at the roost. And uh, Hefe's will do about two point five. So those are the big dogs. Um, and bulls, we love it, and it does great things for us. But making a bunch of profits not one of them. Yeah, yeah, under, understood. So future wise, last question: sure. franchise, company owned. Would you ever franchise any of these models or? I would never say I wouldn't ever do anything. I don't, I mean, I couldn't have told you 10 years ago what I'd be doing today. So, yeah. um, but I don't, I, I'm not driven to franchise. We had, when we opened Smoking Bowls, we talked about it. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's incredible food. It's super fast. People go up to the counter, order their bowl. They go over to get water and hot sauce. And a lot of times we meet them at the table with their bowl. We have it designed with speed in mind. And so mm -hmm. we thought that would be a great one to franchise. Um, and so maybe, um, and then, you know, Hefe's, it's such a unique uh, taco and tequila concept. And we have been really good at standardizing everything. So um, any of the restaurants could, could be franchised. And so, but I, it's not my passion. You know, I, I really, I love being in the restaurant industry. I love what I do. I love spending time with my team. I love creating concepts. So I could see for sure myself opening second and third and maybe five of each, you know, but I don't know that I would want to franchise because like I said, I love uh, creating ship, creating the, the like growth opportunities for my team and, yeah. you know, staff, more staff becoming leads and more leads becoming managers, more managers becoming directors. And, and I've got incredible people that, you know, if that stops someday, then maybe if I need to grow, then I would consider franchising. But, I also don't, I'm not growing because I need to, I'm growing because it's what we all want. Like the whole team yeah. wants to open a fourth restaurant. Yeah. Um, and I've got a cool wife that's okay with it. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. <clears throat> that's a, that's a great story. And, and thank you so much for sharing all that you have already uh, on our show today with our listeners and, and with me. Um, I, as always, I learn a great deal every time I, I get an opportunity to talk to someone like yourself who has, uh, has been there and done that and, and created you know, all this success and your leadership programs and, and your focus on your employees and, and all that is, is very well received um, and something that is needed in this industry uh, that hasn't always existed and, and still doesn't in some places. So um, the fact that you've got a, a happy, healthy uh, group of people who have opportunity, uh, I think is, is what it's all about. And mm -hmm. it seems like that's what it's all about for you as well. So Anyway, I thank you. And, and just as a reminder to all our, our listeners on here, um, if you're in Longmont, Colorado or anywhere near, we've got a, a multitude of, of eating and drinking opportunities for you in Longmont um, with, uh, with our friend Sean Gaffner here. We've got Jefe's Taco and Tequila. We've got The Roost. We've got Smoking Bowls. And soon to come, soon to come, let's see if I got it right. Uh-oh, I lost my note. Ah, uh, there it is. Suelo's Tiki. Suelo's Tiki. Bar. Yeah, there you go. With the, you know, it might even have a pirate ship hanging out of the top of it. So who Yarr. knows? <laughs> but it was a pleasure meeting you, Sean. I, I, I really do thank you for being here and, and appreciate your time and your, your knowledge. Thank you so I'm much. Sure, it's good talking to you too. I appreciate the phone call. Yes, sir. And all of our listeners, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Johnson, and we look forward to seeing you on our next episode.